All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. And maybe you watch the show and you think, I could do a better job. I could ask better questions of the guests than, than I can. So all you got to do is go down to the Patreon link in my description, pick the right tier, and then you could be asking the next questions. You could also be watching these interviews weeks ahead of everybody else. So those are some things to check out. Don't forget to subscribe while you're here. Very important. I'm only going to say that once, not to keep repeating it. So make sure you do that. Okay, today's guest joining us all the way from Finland. That might be the furthest guest we've ever had. We had Spain, uh, Steve Hunter from Spain last week, but I, I think uh, if my geography is correct, Finland is further. So, and if it's not, it doesn't matter. No one's really uh, paying attention to that kind of thing. So, this is a great guest. This is a legend, and I'm a big fan. Sammy Yaffa is here. Most of you know Sammy Yaffa from the incredibly influential band Hanoi Rocks. Half the bands who have been on this show influenced by Hanoi Rocks. He also was in the band Jet Boy, played with Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. And, you know, some people say, well, everyone was influenced by Hanoi Rocks. What about New York Dolls? Well, for good measure, Sammy played with the New York Dolls as well. Six years, made two albums. He's here to promote his first ever solo record. I've heard it. It's great. It's exactly what you're looking for. It's called The Innermost Journey to Your Outermost Mind. We are going to talk all about that and more right after this. All right, no more wasting time. Let's welcome Sammy Yaffa. Right on. Hello. Sammy, I'm really glad that you're doing this. You don't do a ton of these interviews. Nah. You're kind of a shy guy. Nah, well, you know, when I get asked, you know, I do it. There's also not as many in English, though, Sammy. Yeah. Well, I've been here. I moved away from the States about uh, seven years ago. I was in New York for 25 years. I was in L.A. for a while and in San Diego for a couple of years. But uh, I got back here. The home water is way calling in 2014. I moved to Spain first and back here in 2016. How many languages do you speak? Uh, I speak uh, three well and one like like Tarzan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're, you're mentioning being back in Finland. I got to ask you before we dive into it. Are you like a, I mean, are you a legend in Finland? Do people see you and they're excited or they see you all the time? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a small country and all that. And everybody knows each other. But, you know, it's it's a, they. People leave me alone, and uh, they're respectful, and, and usually it's just good times and good vibes and all that. So, Because I'm not sure people realize um, Hannah Rocks is the biggest rock band to come out of Finland. This, you know, And like you said, it's a small country, maybe five, five million maybe? Yeah, five and a half now. Okay. It's, well, it's growing. Yeah, but uh, yeah. But yeah and yeah. so the influence... Yeah. The, oh, they, see, your, their, your fans are calling you now. But the – you never get a rest. But the, the influence of your band is not just um, to the American bands later, but, you know, in, in Finland, this is a very important part of, of, the, of the music history there. But so I want to talk about what it was like for you growing up in Finland. And mm. at what point do you learn to speak English? At what point do you start hearing rock and roll music? Well, I come from a family. I have a – older brother who's eight years older than me and older sister who's six years older than me. So I was born in 63. So when I was like five or six years old, my house was full of Hendrix and Stones and Beatles, Zeppelin and Cream and stuff like that. And from my dad's side, it was like Django Reinhardt and Ornette Coleman. And, and then later my, my brother started playing saxophone and he started he did some records for ECM records and he went full jazz avant-garde kind of thing so we had a lot of music in our household from like from as I said from Ornette Coleman to to the Stones and and uh, then I found my own stuff when I was like in early 70s I I found Alice Cooper and and that ruined me for life mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, uh, created a monster yeah. 
yeah, it's it's uh, those records, those uh, you know, "Love It to Death" and "Killer" and "Schools Out" and and uh, "Billion Dollar Babies." That's that's amazing stuff. And then of course there was Status Quo, and you know, and there was Roddy Gallagher and and Doctor Feelgood and Nazareth and stuff like that. So I grew up on on rock and roll. But the funny thing was that in Finland, it's it's like a very few of those bands that were made here for Europe. But they would stop in Stockholm because there's the water, body of water between between Finland and Sweden, and uh, it would be a you know logistically a pain in the ass to bring all their gear over here. So it's like Alice Cooper band never came here; they played in Stockholm. But Alice came here to do a, a, like a press conference kind of thing, but they never played here. So it's it was kind of like uh, man, we, we we got a border with Russia about a thousand miles, you know. So it's uh, we kind of Tucked in a corner in the north northeast, you know, of Europe, and and uh, it's it, it was a little bit different growing up here. Yeah, I can imagine. And so, do you learn English going to school? Yeah, it's it's uh, you learn the basics, you know. Apple is red and banana is yellow, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff. But uh, my name is. But it it didn't really help me. I I actually, I mean, it helped me a little bit, but not a lot. It's it's it, it was mandatory to learn. English and Swedish school, but when we moved with uh, with Hanno Rocks to to London in 1982, I was like 18 years old, I think, and um, I just sat in the pubs for like two months and just got drunk with the English people, and and uh, my first English words were literally bollocks and pint of lager, please, you know. And, and, yeah, but when you're young, you know, you're like a sponge, you know, you take it all in. I, I learned Swedish the same way. We lived in Sweden first with Hanoi from 1980, 1980 until 82. So I, I learned the language over there and, and uh, you know, and then I moved to U.S. and I, I got this Yankee accent. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we're looking at a picture of Hanoi here. What what year do you think this is? That's in 84. Okay, That's so this is, like, this is later. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's for the last record. Yeah, so be, before before all this, as you're talking about the early years, your original drummer, Jip Casino, what, what a great name. And I got to yeah. ask you, where is Jip Casino now? He's in Stockholm, man. You know, I see him every time I go over there and we stay in touch. And he played a couple of bands afterwards and he's still drumming every now and then with friends, you know, but not professionally. And... Uh, He's actually he's, uh, he's a manager for junior soccer team in Stockholm, and, and uh, he's got a couple of kids, but he's a sweetheart. He's, uh, he's one of my best friends still. He's, uh, he's a great guy, always was. It's great that you've kept these people from your youth and the beginning of your career in, in, in sort of intact with you still, and that goes to your solo record, and we'll, we'll talk about that because you really have the old school guys back with you uh and of course you still perform with michael monroe so that hasn't you've got that going but so talking about hanoi in those days i don't think people realize hanoi only played america one time but you played places that no other bands played i mean you, i always say that you're kind of a, a renaissance man you have just when i think about where you've been and what you do it, it's crazy tell me some of the place countries that you were playing in the beginning Ah, well, we, you know, it's it's like it's it's really weird because we didn't end up playing. We did one little tour in Germany. It was supposed to be ten days, but it ended up being three because our hippie bus driver, van driver, forgot the carnet, the equipment carnet at home, you know, on his kitchen table. So we had to, he had to turn around, and we ended up waiting for him in Amsterdam for four days, which is you know fun, but we didn't get to play. But uh, we played in Scandinavia. We played in UK a lot because we. We uh, put up operations in UK after Stockholm, and we played in Japan a lot. And we ended up playing with Hanoi in uh, in Mumbai and New Delhi in India, where they had been. I think the Boomtown Rats and Clash and Police had been before us in Mumbai. In Delhi, we were first Western rock and roll band ever, and those gigs were just freaking bananas. They were really, really weird and great and crazy and um, you know unforgettable experiences. And, you know, and we we came to uh, to US to make the record in uh, late '83, early '84, I think, and we we landed on Times Square in New York, 
and uh, we we stayed at this place called Milford Plaza on 43rd Street and 8th Avenue and and in back in 1983-84 it was quite different what it's now so it, it was literally it looked like it was from you know the movie Taxi Driver it was pretty heavy and hardcore and and for a bunch of Euro guys to end up over there like that it was uh we had our eyes wide open you know and and uh it was a little bit scary but exciting and you know and and we got to meet a lot of people i mean jack bruce came into we had bob Estrin producing us this record you're looking at here yeah two steps from the and the wall and lou reed and all that you know so we were very lucky to get that guy to produce us and uh he would bring people in we were a little bit stuck with lyrics for some of the songs so he was asking, you know, from us, who do you want to work with? And Andy was our main songwriter. And uh, he said, you know, I would love to get Ian Hunter to work with us. And the next day, Ian Hunter walks into the studio. And and uh, that was pretty nuts, man, because we all were huge fans. And I remember I was doing bass overdubs for one of the songs. It was uh, high school from that record. And there was nobody else in the studio except for me. And and Bob, the engineer, Rod O'Brien, no, James Cena, sorry. And uh, in walks Jack Bruce, and it just sits there and starts looking at me and playing. So I was like, you fucking asshole. <laughs> you know? To Bob Ezrin, it's just like, you put some, you know, put me in the hot seat, so to say, you know. And, and uh, so I had to show him off, and I nailed it in one take, and I said, put that in your pipe and smoke it, and, you know. And it was, it was, it was a really great time, man. Really, really excellent. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's really incredible. So, I mean, this will be the first and only American release, you know, a formal on an American label. And so one of my questions to you is, as we're looking at, there's only three people on this record cover. How does that decision happen? Well, the other two are on the back side. You know, vinyl is vinyl. You can turn it around. So Nasty and Andy ended up on the back side. You know, it's, uh, I don't it's know. A it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's the same photographer who took this photo took the uh i think his last name was ito he did the cover for rolling stones black and blue album so you can see a little bit of the similarity on that yeah but that's just how it goes you know i'm glad that i ended up in the front that's what i was gonna say you were you should be glad you were out on the end <laughs> yeah. and this happened to a lot of bands there's a lot of bands where that happened it didn't fit on the cassette or it didn't fit on the vinyl and people ended up um ended up on the yeah. back so this record uh, you know uh, up around the bend starts getting some play with mtv you make this elaborate video at the time it was the most expensive music video on mtv you guys are probably thinking why, why can't we just have some of that money uh, and make a cheaper video but uh, it never seems to work out that way but so no. uh, so you guys come to america and you you are going to play your first American tour. This is at the end of. Uh, this is around December of 1984. And and so yeah. we 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 know. And it's mostly East Coast dates. In New York, you played Lemoore's, and you played the Ritz. These were big sold out shows in New York. Yeah, we played Danceteria too. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we played some weird ass truck stop outside of philly and and uh it was really weird it was literally a truck stop and there was a little it was like straight out of fucking blues brothers or something you know mm -hmm. and and uh there was just a small stage in the corner and and uh kind of a round bar and a bunch of guys in baseball caps sitting there you know with the you know the the grunt shirts on and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh suddenly it's just filled up with uh with kind of like fans that who knew about Hanoi and, and they maybe came 20 or 30 people who were all dressed up like the dolls and Hanoi and all that. And it turned into a good party. And then the truck drivers realized that we are a rock and roll band. So they got into it. And, and we had a, we had a Russian uh, band driver who'd been in U S for like three weeks. So he barely spoke any English. And, and then on the, on the trips, like after the shows late night, he would sing us Russian folk songs and, I mean, it was pretty yeah. bizarre and weird, you know. Yeah, and and uh, then we ended up getting a bus, and uh, we ended up doing some dates in the in Midwest as well. We played in uh, 
uh, in Cleveland and that in Ohio Peabody's and that ended up being our last show before that had happened the uh, the accident with Andy jumping off the drum riser and he broke Michael's ankle and we ended up stranded in in Georgia in Atlanta for a while and and uh, we lived in this cheap ass hotel and waited for some money from the record label and I think they cut off the the tour support and you know usual you know what I mean yeah you're you're and you're so you're essentially you're you're stranded I mean waiting for him to get better i suppose um so at this point you guys go to los angeles and yeah so we we know that tragically this is how the, the band is pretty much going to end especially your involvement mm -hmm. um december 8th 1984 there uh, there's a party at vince neal's condominium I, i've always wondered were you there well Vince came to pick up me and Razzle from, uh, we stayed at the Franklin Suites in uh, Franklin Plaza Suites or something like that in uh, La Brea, Franklin. Yeah, up there on the top. And uh, he was going to pick up, you know, right, because Razzle and Vince were buddies, so he was going to pick up Razzle and, and show him around, you know, LA and all this stuff. And, and uh, then Razzle said, like, Sammy, come along, you know. And he came with this with a tiny little sports car. It wasn't that car that ended up in an accident. It was another one, but two seater, you know. And there was no room. And Razzle was just like, "Oh fuck it, mate, just hop on my fucking lap," you know. So it was three of us just cruising around L.A. and and uh, he showed us the Santa Monica's and Hollywood Boulevard, and we drove all around L.A. and he was showing the places. There's the Troubadour, and there's the Rainbow, and there's the Roxy, and there's the Whiskey, and you know. So we had a really nice afternoon with vince and and uh and then he said like let's just go back to back to my house and my wife will you know cook some lunch or whatever and some dinner and we we hang out and that's what we ended up doing we ended up hanging out having some beers and smoke a little spliff and and have a good time and 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 talk about things and you know and then little by little it just turned into more of a party but it wasn't really like a crazy party and it was just a bunch of people showed up andy and tommy came there a little bit later and and some of their friends and and uh we've been kind of drinking beer all all day and i just you know said that i'm gonna take a nap you know um, you know they said they said they actually asked me to go with them to go and pick up some more beer and i said i'm gonna take a nap and when i woke up it was just uh mick morris was just kind of shaking me awake and and uh and i wondered where, where everybody else was and and he said that there's been an accident and, and we went to the hospital and i found out that my bro was gone it was very heavy yeah ex extremely heavy and i know that you guys were really close um and so if for, for those who, who might not know vince they ran out of alcohol vince and razzle took the car to the liquor store which was only three blocks away we only wish they would have walked uh and most likely vince was showing off his car the pantera on the way back he crashed into another car, and tragically, uh, two other people. Yeah, Russell was carrying him off. You know what I mean? It's Russell was a speed freak, man. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's um, yeah. yeah, it's just one of those things that happens. And it was an accident. There was some water, you know, and in, in the where they were coming down the hill, and and they just ended up in a slide, and and uh, you know he couldn't. He lost the control of the car, so you know. Was, yeah. Yeah, very heavy and tra and two other people were crippled um you know had yeah. really very serious injuries um as well yeah. they, they they survived and obviously vince survived and this uh the, the, the story at the time and you can tell me if it's correct is that you and razzle were thinking about leaving hanoi anyway is that true yeah i mean hanoi was kind of like like uh it was a little bit falling apart in a way it was it wasn't in the best shape i mean we could have probably overcome you know all the drug problems and all this kind of stuff but uh it wasn't really in a happy place at the time and and uh and i was i was about to leave i kind of had enough i had a fucking heroin habit and, and uh, i barely saw michael he had turned into a hermit and andy had turned into an unbearable egomaniac asshole and and it was basically just me and razzle and nasty who were hanging out together and and uh 
I kind of told him before the tour that I had enough and the Russell came to my house and he kind of talked me over, talked me into it like, you know, come on, Yaffa, you know, it's, I've been thinking the same thing and, you know, but let's just do this one tour and, and then see what happens and, and uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, and obviously uh, we would never find out what would happen. I know yeah. that uh, you guys go back home to Finland. You play two shows as memorial yeah. shows to Razzle, right? Yeah. Our home was in London. We've been living in London since 1982, so we're back to back to UK and and try to figure out what we're gonna do. And I told the guys that I'm I'm out of here, and we had those two two shows to do, which was for. Uh, TV program called Europe A Go Go, which was a massive undertaking. It was like 30 million viewers and all this kind of stuff. And we already had been booked to do that. So we decided that we we're gonna do those two shows as a tribute to Razzle and and then that would be my last shows. And those guys would continue, but that didn't last too long. It was it was, you know, Razzle's death was it was the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, it's it's uh, the band was kind of fragile already, and when, when that happened, it just fell apart. Yeah, uh, you can see those videos; they're on YouTube, and you can see just by watching you that you you look like you're done. <laughs> you know that uh, you're filling your obligation, but maybe it's not as much fun. Terry Chimes from the Clash is playing drums for those shows, and I know they tried to continue with him, and as you said, it just wasn't meant to be. Um, I, I've got to ask you, Andy McCoy and you were friends when you joined. You joined Hanoi I Rocks together. You played in in a band before that. You you tell me the name of the band because I won't be able to pronounce it right. Spelle Miliona O U. There's no way I would have got that. But another legendary kind of punk thing that that you still do, right? Yeah, every now and then. Yeah, it's, it's we we get together like every ten years more or less, and and uh, you know it's 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 a real a trip. We did it first time in uh, in uh, 2010, when it had been 30 years from the uh, from the album. Because me and I was 16 when I was in the band, and Andy was 17, and and the rest of the guys were like 23, 24. And uh, it turned out to be one of those cornerstone albums in 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 Finland, you know, as far as punk goes, and and uh, everybody in Finland knows those songs. So we went to a rehearsal place, and and. Uh, we're looking at each other it's like it's been 30 years since we played and it was really funny because we're like what are we gonna play so we just decided let's play the first single you know the first song that we you know played together and recorded and and it sounded exactly as bad as it did back in 80. it was it was fucking amazing man you know it's That's there's good. something to be said about history it's like everybody's gotten better as 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 musicians of course you know over the years, but when we started playing that song and then playing those songs, it sounded exactly the same. It's something about chemistry, you know. Yeah, well, it's it, it's funny. Yeah, some, some some things aren't meant to be changed too much. But so yeah. you and Andy were friends and, and joined that band, and I know that as you left Hanoi, uh, Andy was a problem, not just for you, for 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 Michael eventually too. It maybe took him a little longer to realize it. My question to you is: Do you have any relationship with Andy? these days or over those years yeah 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 absolutely it's it's uh we're in touch and you know it's it's a, he's a handful that guy you know you can take him in small doses you know what i mean mm -hmm. but uh it's, it's we've been we've been good ever since i mean he came to uh to sweden to play in 1986 i think he came to sweden to play and uh and uh, we hung out then and it's been he came to LA in 1988, and you know we were hanging out then, and it's it's it hasn't really ever stopped. You know, it's a, it's a, the whole Hanoi thing. It's it's a weird family, and just like brothers, you know, you sometimes you quarrel and you have disagreements and all that. But you know, but it's it's a, we went through such a such a formative thing, and uh, you know, when you're like between 16, 17, and 21, 22, it kind of forms you who you are in a way. It's it's those experiences experiences in that age are very very important to everybody and we just happened to go through a very intense and heavy five years together that ended up very traumatically and it left uh, you know a mark on everybody and we all everybody everybody ended up dealing with that trauma in their own ways you know but everybody got the trauma from what happened 
Yeah. And uh, but, but it's like me and Michael we've been friends ever since. Me and Nasty we've been. I just talked to Nasty two days ago, and and uh, you know we're in contact with Andy, and it's 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 all good, and you know it's it's a trippy thing. So I've got to ask you the question that you know I'm going to ask you. Do you think the four surviving members will ever share a stage together again? Yeah. We did. Uh, we shared a stage in 1995 in Helsinki. We played a gig with uh, with Demolition 23. Uh -huh. And Andy happened to come by and, and uh, he came backstage and then came the encore time. And then we went like, well, Nasty was in the band at Demolition 23 at the time. And... You know, and then Andy came on stage and we played, I think, Taxi Driver and Feel All Right and Looking at You or something like that. And it was really funny. It was just like the Pele Miliona thing. It, it sounded exactly the same. There's something about the chemistry, about how people handle their instruments. And, you know, and it was it was really a good time. But we have no plans for anything. But I'm not Nostradamus. And, you know, I take one day at a time and see what happens, you know. Yeah, it, it, something could happen. Because, you know, when you and Michael do play together, I know in, in Finland, um, Nasty occasionally comes by and jams, and that's yeah. three of the surviving members. Uh, Nasty is, yeah. a, of all things, he's a pharmacist, right? Yeah, well, he's a provi provisor. Is, is that a English word? <laughs> he's not really a pharmacist. He's, he's a little right. bit deeper into the pharmaceutical world, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I, I think he might have been a pharmacist a long time ago, but I think now he he like he uh, he's, like you were saying, I think he's more behind the scenes of getting medicines and things into pharmacies. He climbed the corporate ladder, man. You know. Yeah, there might be no better rock and roll name than uh, Nasty Suicide, but no, no, there isn't. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it, 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 it says it all. And it's perfect for the pharmacy industry uh, on top of it, but. Yeah. So well, there's a funny story about that when he when he kind of you know quit music and he went straight for a long time and he went to the school to study and and really got his life together and and uh, he had to do training in Central Helsinki in this pharmacy and he told me that he was there working he had you know glasses on and he had you know he had his normal hair and he was wearing a lab coat and all this shit and and some guy comes over and he wanted to burn cream. And uh, suddenly he recognizes nasty. He's going like, "You're nasty suicide. Do you know what I need this burn cream for?" And uh, that's what no man. What is it? You know. So he rolls his arm over, and there's a half rotten Hanoi rocks tattoo. You know, it was like an infected tattoo that he had gotten, and it was it was actually a Hanoi rocks tattoo. And nasty to say, like, how dang I made the right decision. <laughs> how uh, yeah how full circle is that yeah uh, yeah exactly but, but so okay so uh, you leave hanoi i know you had a child as well and you said you you were also dealing with addiction uh yeah. at, you know getting you were trying to get your own life together and what's so crazy though is that the bands that you influenced are now starting to blow up and the, you could pretty much just throw a dart at any band that played in LA, in Hollywood at the time, and you can find someone who was influenced by Hanoi. I know that everyone talks about Guns N' Roses, and and Guns N' Roses owns that. They they credit that they were yeah. big Hanoi fans. Yeah. But your your Motley Crues and your Poisons, all of these bands were watching Hanoi. They were getting the the imports and things, and the look and. Uh, and obviously the New York Dolls and some of these bands were ahead, but Hanoi was taking that to a whole, a whole nother level. I almost wonder, you, you influenced all these bands. How, what made you guys just decide we could pull this off? Because it was it was pretty original. Well, we didn't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, it's it's we did what we thought was cool, and and um, you know, we just we were fucking five crazy little kids, man, who just did what they wanted to do, and and what was our lucky thing was in a way, you know, is is that uh, we had Andy McCoy as a songwriter because you know his his material was, in my mind, you know, it was pretty fucking intense for for a guy to be writing that kind of stuff at 17, 18 year old, eighteen years old, and. And uh, so we realized that we have something good going on. And, and uh, it took three years before any major label would sign us because they wanted to change us to 
be you know more of a hard rock band or a more of a new romantic band like duran duran or some shit like that and and uh we just didn't go for it we just you know stuck to our guns and wanted to do what we what we felt was right in the heart you know and and uh that's how you should always do and we were just a little bit ahead of time and you know the timing wasn't right we lived the way that we lived and c'est la vie what you're gonna do you know? Yeah, and barring the tragedy, you know, who knows what would have happened because you can't you can't meet a musician from Hollywood or someone in the know who doesn't say no Hanoi rocks, no Guns and Roses. I mean, you and and the others. You, it's a constant thing. And so, what always kind of got to me, and I'm sure it got to you, is so all these bands that were influenced by you are getting rich, and you guys are struggling. You know, uh, eventually the band Jet Boy. Um, comes to you and I had Mickey Finn on the show and I even said Sammy probably needed the money at that point you know uh, to go they to Hollywood oh, I was in Stockholm and I had my baby and uh, you know it's it's I didn't want to play it, it was I was really burned out on 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 playing or being in a band or and the drugs and the industry and all that so you know it's I was very happy having a kid you know it's it's um, I had to do menial jobs in order to survive and all this kind of stuff but i didn't it didn't bother me you know it's i take life as it come you know i don't like complaining about it too much and but i started literally i started itching to play it was i realized that i wasn't made to be a guy doing a regular nine to five job you know it's it's uh i was pushed into this path as a 16 year old for some kind of a reason and uh I happened to go. It was going bad between me and uh, my girlfriend, you know, with with, uh, with my son's mother, and so I went to London to see uh, what's going on over there. And London was was still in the in this like horrible grip of heroin. I mean, it was really bad. It was easier to find smack than it was to find smoke, you know. And and uh, everybody that I knew were more or less addicted to it. And I had gotten my ass out of that, and I was not planning to go back on that. So. I wanted to go get back to Sweden and see what's going on, and and uh, I wanted to go. I went to say hello to uh, to Hanoi's one of the Hanoi Rocks adventures, which is Bishop. Before I went back, and uh, he said, "Like, hey, funny that you came by that last week. This band called Jet Boy was supposed to get hold of you. That uh, this band called Jet Boy got in touch with me and sent me their demo tape, and said they're looking for you. That they need a bass player. That they're having problems with their bass player and their signed band and." They are from San Francisco, but they're based in LA. And uh, would you be interested? And I was like, give me the tape, you know. And I went home and I listened to it. And I thought there was some cool stuff in there. You know, it was like, you know, a lot of potential. And it was a demo tape, you know. And uh, then I saw some pictures and I saw Mickey with a mohawk. I was like, all right, okay, cool stuff. And, you know, it's because I come from punk rock. I don't come from, you know, I come from literally from punk rock. And, and, uh, I just thought, like, why not? You know, I was stuck in Stockholm with like snowstorms and shit was bad with my, you know, kid's mother, and and uh, I thought that I needed a job and I needed to get back in the back on my feet and back in the business. And and uh, and these guys, they they seem to be cool, and I just want to go check it out. And I I really didn't have any idea what was going on in LA, in LA at the time. I had no idea. So when I got there. Like the second night, I think it was, uh, they took me to Cat House. You know, La Siena guy was on that place, La Siena at the time, Ricky Rackman's place. And and I walked in there, it's like hundreds of kids, and, you know, and they all more or less look like Hanoi. It's like, oh, there's five nasties, and there's eight Michaels. And, you know, it was, it was a really a trip, man. It, it blew my mind. It was, you know, and I remember I met Slash, for the first time at that time here yeah, i was sitting at the bar and there was some guy in leather pants and no shirt and top hat i don't know how it stayed on his head but he was doing cartwheels and he was buddies with uh with with the jet boy guys so he just rolled over with cartwheels and stopped high and slash and then he kept going and i was like who the fuck was that <laughs> you know yeah. it was a fun you know, place at the time yeah i sure it was yeah uh but you know, so Jet Boy got signed pretty early, and they would they the record would get pushed back. There was so much with that band, um, and by the time the record comes out, it was almost getting to be too late. Yeah, 
it was another timing thing. I was too early with Hanoi and too late with Jet Boys. So, you know, yeah, it's timing. Yeah, we we did a we did the record for Electro Records, and we had the release date, and the release date was January 1988. And uh, if we had gotten that release date, things could have been maybe different, you know what I mean? But we got dropped by Electro literally, by, I think, two weeks before the uh, the record release, which is completely insane. They put a lot of money into our band, and, you know, we had shot the video, and we had Tom Allen, who produced Judas Priest, producing the album, and, and uh, then suddenly we just got the news that we dropped. And, uh, you know, that kind of... Pull the carpet under us and we started looking for a new label and we got picked up by mca but by the time the record came out you know it was already a year had gone had gone by and all these other bands that faster pussycats and all this you know had already gone out there la guns and all that and uh we just kind of missed the boat and yeah, uh and then then we were, excuse me you kind of get lost in that shuffle that you were there before but just that one problem Everyone runs ahead. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's also we didn't really have that big, big song. You know, I think that's that's one of the things that you know I can't forget. Like you need the you need the goddamn hit guy. You know. <laughs> yeah, you know, Sammy. I, I should also point out that there is a parallel in tragedy between Hanoi and, and Jet Boy, the bass player before you, Todd Crew. Um, was suffering from addiction. The reason they needed you is because he suffered. Another young yeah. guy, Razzle, passed away at 24. I think Todd Crew is even younger. And um, he goes to New York with Slash. And I'm almost positive he died at the Milford Plaza. O almost positive. The same yeah. hotel that yeah. Hanoi first yeah. went to. Yeah, it's a weird thing. It's I mean, I, I met Todd and, and we hung out and I talked to him about, you know, getting wasted on daily basis and and i i tried to talk some sense to him and he was a sweetheart he was a really 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 nice guy and and uh if he had gotten his act together i would have stepped aside in a heartbeat you, you know for him to get back and all that but it's just uh it was it's really 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 sad again and i have a lot of friends who went you know in in the 90s in, in early 90s i had a a period of like maybe a year and a half where more or less in a in monthly basis I lost a friend and and uh it was all to 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 either booze or booze and pills or heroin or whatever and it's it's really tragic that young lives get snuffed out young and talented people just you know end up going way too Most early. people don't beat the heroin addiction I mean you're a survivor and there's a few other who are too but if you think about some of our heroes and, and, and my heroes, people you've actually performed with, mm -hmm. you know, um, the heroin usually wins someone like Didi Ramon and maybe it took longer, but eventually mm -hmm. that addiction comes back if you're not in the right place um, to beat it. We're speaking about heroin addiction. You know, I've got to ask you a big one to me before Jet Boy and after Jet Boy, you were playing with Johnny Thunders and Jerry Nolan at the same time, right? Yeah, I did some gigs with those boys. <laughs> There's no more punk rock credibility than that. You played with four yeah. New York Dolls. Yeah, man. You know that's uh, I'm a lucky boxer. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it it was really funny because we we played. I got to know Johnny and Jerry. We did a, a tour in UK with Hanoi, and I think '83. Or 84 and and uh, we did some shows we did a tour together with Johnny Jerry wasn't in the band then but uh, after Hanoi split up I moved to uh, to Sweden back to Stockholm and and I was sitting in subway and in the back of the train there's sitting Jerry Norman and Johnny Thunders I was like, what the fuck are they doing here you know sitting in the subway train and I walked over them and I was like hey Sammy how you doing man you know it's like I'm living here. It's like, yeah, we live it too here, man. You know, so where do you live? And it turns out that 
Jerry lived one subway stop from me, and Johnny lived two subway stops from me, outskirts of Stockholm in the suburbs. So weird. And so we started hanging out, and I would go to Johnny's house and spend afternoons over there with my kid, you know. And Johnny would play cars with my kid. It's like, hey, come here, Nicky man, you know, catch this, catch the ball, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, he would play his new song ideas, and then we would watch some, you know, Humphrey Bogart movies or W.C. Fields movies or whatever. And it's just, you know, we, we were friends. And he would call every now and then and go, like, hey, Sammy, you want to make some money? <laughs> I was like, yeah, why not, John? You know, and, and uh, I, I love those dudes a lot. They were one of a kind. You will never make anybody like that again. Those four, man, David Sill. John and Jerry, just fucking piece of work, man. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I mean people know that you play the New York Dolls because you did it for six years and you made two albums. But I don't think that people knew as much that you played with, with Jerry and Johnny as well. They were both passed away, obviously, when you joined um, the, the yeah. Dolls. But what a, what, a, what a school of hard rock knocks, or, you know what I mean, to, to, to be with those cat Because they were extreme characters, as you, you know. They're almost like, you know, the Three Stooges or, you know, or... Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, being on the road with, uh, with, with David and Seal was like being on the road with Abbott and Costello, man. I swear mm. to God, it's just nonstop, man. I don't think I ever laughed so much in a band as I did with, with New York Dolls. It was, you know, really loved that time. Yeah, you, you introduced me to Sylvain because we wanted to have him play here in Las Vegas, just like we had you a bunch of times. And yeah. you, you set it up, and as you say, he was the ultimate character. If he didn't remember someone's name, yeah. he didn't remember anyone's name, they were all Jackson. Hey, Jackson. Hey, Jackson. And he would whisper yeah. in my ear. Yeah, you, you didn't hear my name, you were still Jackson. I was a Jackson. I think, yeah, I think everyone stays Jackson. Because then he would say, what's this guy's name? He'd whisper to me. And I'd tell him, you know, that's uh, Rob. And he'd go, I'm going to call him Jackson, you know. And... Uh, he 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 was an, an original and uh, like you said, such a character. And sadly, he passed he passed away. And uh, yeah. you know, and and David is the last of the original. You know, of yeah. the original dolls. Yeah. Um, why did the New York Dolls run end for you? Uh, <clears throat> it kind of started to run out of steam. You know that the, uh, the 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 gigs and the tours were fewer, and uh, the money was going down. And and uh, me and Steve and Brian were making about half of what David and Sil were making, so it wasn't an equal split. So it started to be very hard for us to make a living, and and uh, we didn't really know where the band was heading. We we didn't really quit the band. With Steve, it's it's. I ran into Michael. We played actually with the Dolls in in uh, in in Finland, and Michael came up on stage with us and you know played some sax and harp, and uh, and me and Michael ended up hanging out afterwards all through the night, and we ended up talking, and and we both felt like the Demolition Twenty Three thing didn't really. We didn't see it to the end, you know. It was we both loved it. It's it's both of our favorite record, basically that we've done, and and. Uh, it's uh, it just ended too early, and we were thinking about that maybe we should do something together, and uh, we started looking for people. And you know, Todd Youth was a good friend of mine, and and uh, he was supposed to be in the band, and and, and Jimmy Clark from Demolition Twenty Three was supposed to be in the band, and we just uh, started putting it together, and and we had a lot of breaks with the dolls, that nothing was happening, and and. Uh, I left a message. I, you know, I told the management that we, Steve and I are going to go and make a record with Michael in September. So please keep that two weeks open. You know that that even if something comes, try to book it around it. You know, and and then of course he had booked the new Dolls record and the tour and the whole thing exactly at the same time. So it it literally was a question for me to decide. You know what I want to do. You know, it's it's uh, uh, there was a really good vibe with Michael, and and uh, we felt like we we're doing something new and and fresh, and and it had a kind of rebirth kind of feeling, and and I just had to tell him, you know, sorry guys, I can't, you know, I'm gonna 
if I have to choose, I don't want to choose, but I can have my cake and eat it too, you know what I mean? So I chose, you know, I, I wanted to go with Michael and, you know, rest is history. It's, and That's we didn't, something. we never ended up, in, we never ended up in a, in a bad, you know, kind of like, ah, oh, you motherfucker, you left us, you know, there's none of that, you know, we stayed friends all the way through and they understood, Sylvain and David understood why we, why we split. Yeah. And so to play with Michael is something that's yours. You know, this is part of your legacy and you'll make music together and you can tour it together. And the dolls really was the two guys. And you, you made the right decision, obviously, because it, it didn't last much longer, you know, yeah. um, and uh, and it became a revolving door of, of other guys at that point. No disrespect to any of them, but, you know, it, yeah. it, it was it was watering down. And obviously you've kept the thing with Michael going uh, and, and, and yeah, still going. It had all right, we jumped all around Sydney. Yeah. We're, we're, before we talk about the record, the new record, the solo record, the innermost journey to your outermost mind, and we talk about the book. But we we've got to uh, and thank you for coming up with a title that's a tongue twister. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I've got to ask you two out of order questions, uh, out of order of timeline. Uh, Joan Jet, you were in Joan Jet in the Black Hearts for a year. Tell me uh, about that. Yes. Two years? Okay, two years. Yeah, yeah, 2002. Well, a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, somewhere along there. Yeah, fucking honor, man. It was an honor to be playing with Joan. You know, that's all I can say. It's uh, I got to, I got to play with Joan Jet for a year and a half. You know, yeah, it was pretty amazing. You know, it's uh, yeah. Was there a reason why you didn't do this longer? Yeah, it wasn't. I don't want to really talk bad about anybody. You know, it just lasted as you know, long as it it was supposed to last. You know, and and I love Tommy Price and I love Dougie and I love the crew and all that. But you know, there's um, you know, there was a vibe that wasn't really happening for me. You know, and it wasn't from anybody in the band. It wasn't from yeah, Joe. Was, yeah, I know who it was. It was the keyboard player. <laughs> We yeah, don't have to was, say. We don't have yeah, to say who he is. Yeah, it was it was like a dark cloud, man. It was like, you know, I like positive stuff. You know, I like I like positive energy, and and uh, there was too much negative energy in there, and, and I was just kind of, and I felt like a hired hand. You know, it's it's sure. um, the pay was okay. It wasn't you know fucking you know like hey man, you know I can actually look in the future and save some money. Yeah. It was hand to mouth living, and and it got to a point that. That you know, why am I doing this? You know, it's a paycheck. You know, and and uh, it's it's the same songs every night. But no disrespect for Joan, you know, because she's she's I love her. She's fucking amazing. You know, she's one of the best rhythm guitar players I I know. Yeah, she's a badass. And she was, you know, she earns all the respect that she has. She's a fucking originator, man. Yeah, and but for you, it wasn't going to be a long term thing. That and and that and that's. And you know, and that that's pretty much that on on that case. Yeah. Ball, I'm after that. No, I, I quit and uh, I was kind of ready to go work in a record store or whatever it is, not to make ends meet. And uh, then I just suddenly got like maybe a month or two months after, two and a half months after I, I quit the Black Hearts, I uh, got a phone call from for Donna from Cycle Sluts and, and She Wolves called me up and said that. Uh, Sylvain Sylvain is looking for me because I read that the Dolls had done a, a reunion gig at the Royal Festival Hall that uh, that Morrissey created. Yeah, huge. And at first, I thought like, oh, that's a little weird, you know, no Johnny and Jerry, and you know, I was kind of like, you know, just like probably a lot of other people were, you know, because they are so strong characters, Thunders and Nolan, that that how can they pull it off and and. Uh, they, um, I had met Sil a few times before, and we got along like a house on fire. We just, you know, we just can't stop talking. It's like we were, it's, it's, it, it really, our relationship was really just flowing always. You know, our sense of humor is the same, and we both like clothes, and we both like music, and we both like to laugh, both like to have a little bit of wine, and you know, it's, it's, um, it was like an older brother to me, and, and, uh, when he when Donna said that he's looking for my phone number, can I give it to him? I was like, yeah, come on, you know, just fucking hand it over to him, you know. And then he called me up. It was like, hey Jackson, you know, uh, 
you want to play in the dolls? <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, uh, you know, I had heard that, that Arthur had died. I mean, he literally just did those Royal Festival Hall shows or show. And then he got one sick show. and he went back to OM. Yeah, one show and, and he passed away. It's incredible. It's it's like he got to. I think he was waiting his whole damn life to do that, you know. And and uh, then he got to do it, and then it was kind of I'm out of here. It's, it's a great uh, documentary that that shows that yeah. process. It really does give that feeling that he was waiting for this, and then he went peacefully. Yeah, exactly, exactly. God bless him, man. It's it's a uh, also killer Kane. Yeah. But uh, Sylvain said that. I have to audition to David because David doesn't know who Hannah Rox is and he doesn't know who you are. And I was like, fine, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I know those two songs, two, those albums, like the back of my hand. I just have to check up the, mm -hmm. the, the, the keys that they go from. And, you know, and, and uh, I went to Steve Conti's rehearsal place in Manhattan and there was some other bass player walked out of there and he was wearing like an anthrax t shirt and shorts and he had a goatee. I just thought to myself, like, I got the gig. <laughs> yeah, he didn't, he didn't and, body the doll. No, he didn't look like a doll at all, man, you know. And uh, I went in there and I got to play literally the whole first album, you know, with David and Syl. And, and to me, that was enough, whether I get the gig or not. I was just like, no, I'm a happy guy. I'm a pig and shit. This is the best thing ever happened to me. I got to play that entire first album, you know, with those two guys. And, and uh, then two days later, Sylvain called me up and said, like, Jackson, you got the gig. No, let's go. And then it was six years. It was only supposed to be, in the beginning, it was only supposed to be the Little Stevens Randall's Island gig and, uh, uh, and a tour in Japan. And I think a couple of festival things in, uh, in UK with White Stripes and Peaches. Those were the only, you know, contractual things that they were, you know, that they had to do. So I thought that that's going to be it, that I'm just going to do the, maybe those, you know, those shows and then that's it. But but then we started getting along so well and, and uh, the song started popping up and it, it just grew very organically, the whole thing that maybe this is not just like, you know, New York Dose Reunion, maybe this is just uh, something new, you know, and... and uh, but also to do music with respect to the legacy, you know, that uh, I know that Johnny and Jerry would have approved. I know that. And uh, it, was, it was amazing six years, man. It really was. It, was. it was, as I said, it was the most fun time I ever had. I never laughed so much. Yeah. And, and, and get to play next to Sylvain on stage right every night was just a fucking blast. It really was. He was a, he's an amazing guitar player. Absolutely, force of nature. Yeah, he was definitely underrated, underrated. because, yeah, they underrated. Johnny so much, but yeah, um, but yeah. that was his chance to, to, to shine, and uh, and you know, and then you get to hear him. He's like you said, he's hilarious, and of course, he's going to say things like, "Would you like some coffee?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a funny guy, man. He would. He came to me literally. We did this one tour with, uh, I think it was in UK, or we had. Maybe it was in Europe. I can't remember, but we did this one tour, and he comes in between every song. He comes up to me because he had a really, you know, bad eyesight. He would come up to me and go like, "Hey, Jackson, what's the next song?" You know, and I would tell him the next song. I started getting tired of it, you know. And then Duncan printed a uh, a set list like this size, and mm -hmm. he put it right in front of Sil. Sil saw it. And this went on for a week, and the set list has got bigger and bigger and bigger until the set list was the entire side of Sylvain's where he plays. He was standing on the set list, and he still came and went like, "Hey, Jackson, what's the next song?" <laughs> you know, it was a funny guy. Loved it to yes. death. Yeah, another real uh, uh, amazing original, and he's got a book out there as well. Um, so. After some of the music, people start to realize what, what, what we already knew is that you are this renaissance man. In 2012, you're invited to co-host Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations. He's going to Finland. Who better to show him around Finland than you? Anthony Bourdain also knew his punk rock music. 
you know, he, he yeah, was a fan yeah. of me. Yeah. Yeah. And tragically, uh, he, he's also passed since. But uh, so tell me a little bit about what this was like for you. It's like a mortuary show. It's kind of, a, you know, everybody's dead. God damn it, man. You know. <laughs> yeah, you better, you better stay around. Yeah, man. But so tell me what it was like showing Anthony around Finland, because to, to an outsider, I've seen the episode, you know, I've learned that in Finland, you guys love saunas, but uh, sometimes you go to the sauna and you do this cupping thing where <laughs> you explain it. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's this club in, uh, in New York on 14th street called Otto shrunken head. And there's the, uh, the part owner is this lady called Nell. And uh, Neil was buddies with uh, with Anthony's production team, and and uh, they had called. Like, Do you know any Finns in New York? Because Neil knows everybody. And uh, she said that the Dolls bass player Sammy is a Finn, you know. So if you want to get in touch with him, I'll ask him, you know. So they got in touch with me, and uh, they they started saying that they're going with Anthony Finland. I, I told him right off the bat that I'm completely the wrong guy. I haven't lived in Finland since I was 16 years old. You know, I don't know shit about their culinary habits, except that it's it was very bad back in the day, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but also I knew that that Finland's changed a lot, and uh, you know, it's it's gotten more international, if you want to call it that. And it it does have it have its very own personality. It's not like Sweden. It's not like Norway. It's not like any other place on earth. Finland is a very unique place, and. So I met with them and I told them what I know about Finland, what I think, and la di da da, and they liked it. And and then they asked me to be on camera with Anthony, and I asked them when, and they said right after New Year's. And I happened to be in Helsinki doing a New Year's gig with Michael, and I just said that if you pay me, uh, you know, the per diem and and keep me fed and in drinks and give me a hotel room, you know, I stayed there for that week that they needed for me there to to shoot. And uh, and that's what happened. And I met Anthony, and he was like, uh, it was really funny, man. You know, it's it's like he's a trippy guy. It's uh, like he can be standoffish and very close, and uh, very very funny guy. And uh, but at the same time, when we we're shooting this, like as soon as the camera kind of game came on, you know, it it it. It became kind of like okay, I'm here with Anthony Bourdain, and then camera came off, and then he relaxed, and you know, very special kind of dude. And uh, but then when we started talking about music, it was like oh, oh. it's a to a to radio station, Radio Rock in Helsinki, and they had asked, they had asked Anthony for his top ten songs that they're gonna play while we're. Been interviewed and it, it was amazing. It was Dead Boys, it was Thunders, it was Stones, it was Stooges, it was MC5. It was it was everything that I would have put on that that list. And and, uh, and then we started talking about because he was he would give free meals to like Cheetah Chrome, you know, when he was working in some restaurant midtown, and he started telling me all these stories and hanging out with Thunders and all that. And then that's when we started sinking, and we ended up having a really really great time. For the rest of the the, the shoots, and uh, I got to uh, we we went on this. They do this kind of like ice racing in Finland with these beat up old cars, and and uh, I got to knock him off the track. <laughs> it was very satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I, ice racing. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just these beat up old Volkswagens, you know, with uh, that that were very souped up. You know, the engines. You know, it would just rev up to fucking you know thousand miles an hour but it was a nice so it just ended up sliding on it and you know and, and uh it was it was it was a good trip man but when i was when i was yeah i, I want you when to I tell me about this cupping thing huh the thing where the they cupping. with the where they put the cups on you and they cut you and you bleed yeah well that's like a thousand year old tradition here in finland it's it's getting rid of the bad blood you know it's the the bad stuff that ends up caking up in your, you know, in your back and, you know, while you get, which in massage, you know, they, they kind of move it around and then it, it breaks down and then moves away and, and then you're okay. In Finland, if you get too much, like feeling bad, you actually end up getting cupped and they have these little metal knives that look like 
tiny little hockey sticks, you know, but they're super sharp and they do two hits and it little tiny puncture wounds. And then they put the cup on it and it looks nasty as a motherfucker, man. It's, it's, uh, it looks like your spleen is like escaping your body through your back. And uh, the one you put there is you lose a half a liter of blood. One deciliter, more or less. Yeah, one deciliter. You, ha had you done this before the TV show? Yeah, I do it every now and then. I haven't done it now for a while, but but uh, it's it's my friend Ronnie from Smack. You know, he's, he's an old buddy of mine. He uh, I, he does it still, I think, kind of religiously. And and uh, I did it a few times, and it, and it's like you walk out of there, you feel like you're taking an inner shower. It's it's I recommend it to everybody. And uh, I had to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you come to Finland, man, I get you caught, man. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had just done it, and I, you know, when when I went for the second meeting with them, I had been in Finland. I had just done it, and I'd taken some photos or whatever with like twenty cups on my back, and I covered in blood, and you know, there's blood leaking everywhere. And, I just showed it to their production team. It's like, well, I can go and you know, Anthony can go and do this. And they just fucking, they fell down in hysterics. They said, done, we have to do this. And then from then on, I think, I think that that's what sold me to, to the boarding production team. Is the yeah, you, you, you brought, you brought an interesting, uh, authentic tradition. And yeah. so I Sammy, I watch you and I've been fortunate to know you for a while. And th I think people discovered your television and your personality because here comes sound tracker. Wow. It's, okay, I did three so this, seasons with them. And so with this my show, program, yeah, yeah, this show. I, I I love watching you. You show these beautiful places. I, I'm I'm a neurotic New Yorker, Sammy. I watch you, and I just want to stay in my house and watch you on TV. I, I you go, guys are charming rattlesnakes, cobras, whatever it is. You you you're getting your back cupped. You you're, you're up for anything. And you find some of the most amazing musicians and bands and culture. More than anything, you discover so many different cultures um, yeah. and bring it to the mainstream. Yeah, it was like I got that idea while I was doing Anthony's program. You know, I was wondering why nobody had done it with music yet, because music is just as diverse and just as place specific as food is. And, and I think it shows the cultures and, and uh, people's uh, ways of living and and all that just as well as, as food and maybe even better, you know. And, and uh, I just, it, it's weird. Sometimes the universe is collide. It's, it's a, there's this Finnish director called Otso Tiainen over here that I had met once. We did a short one thing with Matt Wana with my other band that I used to have with my ex-wife and, and uh, he filmed us for like maybe half an hour and I met him and I thought like, oh, what a curiously cool guy and, and, and uh, you know, great mind and all that. And after I'd come home from the, the Bourdain shoot, I came back to New, to New York, to Brooklyn, and I'd been thinking like, why wouldn't, you know, maybe there would be some you know good idea to do a program like that, but with music and, and literally open up my email and there's message from Otso going like, hey, why don't we do a program about the music of the world, you know? And I, I literally wrote back to him and I said, Bourdain style. You know what I mean? That you, it's it's just as relaxed and just as weird and, and we're not going to go and look for the biggest stars of the country or something like that, that we actually go into the street level and, and we find interesting musicians that we think is interesting musicians. And, and if we can snare in some interesting big stars so be it you know we're not going to say no to it but but we can also because this was also uh things started getting kind of in europe and and us and and uh you know people were kind of like looking at other cultures and other religions and and all these places with kind of like oh we don't trust them and we don't trust that and weird and all that so i kind of just wanted to kind of open a door and 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 to the rest of the world and, and just you know show that that we are a lot more alike than you think you know the regular people you know assholes are assholes everywhere in the world you know you can't help that i think i could wipe them out but i can't nor can the rest of the humanity you know it's it's uh 
so uh, we did a it was really funny we did like a demo we went to a bar here in, in i mean in Helsinki at, uh, with just one camera and and i didn't write anything down and i did like a three minute monologue about what this program that we wanted to do is going to be about and then we went to the youtube and we took bits and pieces of musicians in india or in morocco or in new orleans and we put together this like a five minute demo demo video for for a possible production company because you need to find a production company before you go straight to the channels you know to the tv and we found uh this this company called give me a wallet and they used to do this <laughs> they used to do this uh this brilliant uh, travel series called Mad Ventures. You know, they, I think they had three or four seasons and they, they got it out all around the world. And it's just these two maniac Finn guys who does craziest fucking shit that you can ever imagine all around the world. And we got them to, uh, to produce it and pitch it. And we did a, another a little bit more expensive thing where we where also the director came to, uh, to, to New York and stayed with me for a week. And we went to Sixth Street and we filmed the uh, the Sikh musicians in the window and we we interviewed them as we were in Rajasthan. And then a friend of mine had a, a Cuban party at this uh, fancy hotel in Soho every Saturday. So we went there and it made it look like we were in Cuba. And a friend of mine owns this Bulgarian bar called Mehanata on Ludlow Street in 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 new york and they happened to have a, a bulgarian gypsy wedding there so we went and filmed that and it looked like we were in fucking bulgaria mm -hmm. and so on we made it look like in new york in one week that we've been around the world and we put together this really kind of exciting thing and went and presented to the to the national television of finland which is you know like the bbc whatever over here and, and uh, they bought it and we ended up doing three seasons in 18 countries and it came out on netflix here on the in Scandinavia and it's been bought I think to 20 different countries and and you can see it on PBS on on link tv.org in in US and in Canada and you know it was a that was a trip man that was thank you wherever that came from you know yeah and I think that people will, will enjoy this because you know you don't really interfere with the artists I mean the, the, the performers occasionally you'll jam with somebody but for the most part it's you you pay full respect to these people and their culture and it's and some of them are very different and you watch it as an admirer and i i think it's a it's a really fresh approach to that and it, and for people who really want to you have to have an open mind to discover new yeah. music because these are things that we've never seen before yeah it's it's to me it was like a gift from god from the above or something because i always liked all music i've never been a, a tunnel vision kind of guy it's like i want to eat other food than pizza you know what i mean yeah i think music is exactly the same and uh that i got to do this was a complete blessing you know it's it's uh and and when i go and it's a weird thing because i'm a musician myself if i was just an interview guy reporter or something and i would go there i think the musicians would would react differently and and i don't think they necessarily open up as easily you know but you know they knew that i was a musician and and uh i treat their culture and their music with respect and i'm genuinely interested yeah. in them in and in their country where they come from and in their instruments and in their music and in their families and then in their you know society well, you're very so, you're authentic yeah and and they yeah. you have credibility the person you are it's funny is that even though you're this punk rocker at heart you really are a person of the world who has a a, a high knowledge of of different cultures and respect for them and i think that these people um they see that you're the real deal with it and, and you're right you couldn't just send whoever the mtv person is to do it it just wouldn't work yeah world is an interesting place you know i really dig this world you know and so should everybody else you know and 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 really like uh, all the other cultures and you know and, and don't take people for the face value where they come from and you know don't judge you know it's it's uh get to know people and and cultures and it doesn't matter where they're from yeah you know it's that's the one thing i learned when i when we when we started hanoi rocks it's uh when we moved from Feeling to Helsinki, I was 17 years old, and and you know, I thought that we had an apartment waiting for us there in Stockholm, but we didn't. So we ended up living on the streets for about a half a year, and and that this was in uh, 
the fall and the winter in in Stockholm, so it was very hard. And and the other dudes that were living on the street were literally like Palestinian refugees, Ethiopian, Eritrean, Afghanistani refugees, and and uh, we ended up becoming part of them. You know, it, we had the same problems and different language, different hue of skin, and different religion. But it didn't matter. We 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 faced the same problems, and we became like brothers. And then that's when I started understanding that you know we are in the bottom we are the same you know and, and uh, we started talking about you know our families and you know what do they want from life and all this kind of stuff and it's it's uh it's um uh, i can't stand this fucking thing that is going on with with putting you know borders and, and dividing people and all that you know because of some megalomaniac here or there wherever they are they pop up you know all through the world's histories like my dad said something very interesting when i talked to him he passed away a couple of years ago but i was complaining about something you know about somebody in the, in the politics and all this and he was like look man you know when i was a kid there was four dictators in in europe four you know what i mean there was stalin there was hitler there was that guy fucking in portugal and mussolini you know what i mean when he was a kid so he said like we're doing okay right now <laughs> it's uh you know there will always be that there will always be the power hungry maniacs who will play the people like a fiddle this is this is old stuff and and i'm just uh kind of surprised that people don't see this and well, also you're right. that, we've never been more divided as a world not just a country you know people are just yeah. uh yeah it's 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 happening everywhere it's it's uh, it's happening in spain it's happening here it's happening there it's it's uh you know but you gotta have hope and it's in and a lot of these places you know we went to turkey and and uh it was very interesting because of course i wanted to talk about turkey because there's erdogan and you know it's it's a pretty uh, you know authoritarian regime and I just wanted to find out from the horse's mouth, from the people who live there, you know, from the musicians and all that, what do they think about, you know, situation in Turkey has a pretty hardcore history with repression and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, they all had an opinion. Even the belly dancer had an opinion. It was, we, I, I literally had to ask one question. It was, boom, it was half an hour of, you know, talking about the situation and what's wrong and what should change and all this kind of stuff. So, you know it's it's everywhere where you go it's it's people have gripes more or less i haven't run into a perfect place yet you know what I mean? absolutely okay sammy well we we got to talk now we 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 you we, we went through <laughs> we got a lot of history but we got to talk about some new history right here sammy Offa, the innermost journey to your outermost mind this is available september 3rd everywhere you can pre-order it right now the single the last time is available where you stream music it's also available on youtube and this is a great song say i mean i really it's the perfect first single the lyrics are are fun and clever the very first time the second last time it's uh i think we all yeah. relate we can all relate to that in in the in i think in many ways in relationship ways and and uh, how we make promises to ourselves and and uh it's kind of a thing between i was like a stepdad to this kid for about six years who was going through his teenage thing you know from 12 till 18. and uh you know teenage years are hard for everybody and and uh, you know you, you do stuff that you don't necessarily want to do and you promise that it's always the last time you know i won't do it again and then you do it again and it's the second last time and you know and also some of the lyrics are kind of about what you it's a dialogue between two people but it's also about the things that you say and it's also the things that you say inside you know because um it's not always good to say everything out blur it out because it might not be wise and it might inflame the situation so that was actually the first song that i wrote for the record it's, it's kind of old it's been around for about six years or something like that it's a great choice for the first single because it's a rocker it's a punk song and i think it, it you know yeah. it's easy to to get into um records it's 11 songs it's an easy listen. If you are a fan of any of the bands that Sammy was involved in that we talked about, then you're going to like this record. And I got to say, 
whenever a friend has a project, I go, oh man, this better be good because I don't want to be the asshole who listens, listens to it and goes, how do I say it's good? But I go, and I'm being honest, Sammy, I go, there's no way Sammy is going to disappoint me. I've seen all of the bands you've been in. I remember Mad Wanna. I know your contributions to music. And I said, he's not going to let me down. Two songs in, I'm, I'm hooked. Three songs in, next thing you know, 11 songs go by. And it's not just punk rock, though. You, you have a little bit of everything. And you've got a great voice. You, you know, I think you, you're almost like a, a punk rock Tom Waits or Bob Dylan as well. You know, they're... Uh, and don't let that deter people from from this. But it's no, exactly. <laughs> somebody might go, "Oh no!" But no, this is uh, it's like Pavarotti, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that people will enjoy. It. And so, tell me a little bit about what goes into making your first solo record. Well, it's it's a uh, I I've written music with uh, with the Dolls and and with Michael Monroe and and. And uh, with my own band, you know, with Madonna and all this kind of stuff. So I always co-written music. And, and uh, when you co-write music with, with bands, you kind of like try to write in a certain way that might fit that band. You know what I mean? And then I realized that I have a lot of stuff that is cool but didn't really fit anybody. And, and uh, then I started listening to it. And then I started realizing that this is actually my music. And I'm kind of lazy with a lot of things even though it doesn't seem like that. So I just let, kind of let it sit for a while and, and uh, let it marinate. And uh, I had most of the music done. I had like three songs with the lyrics and then the melodies done, but then I had like the rest of the, like six and a half songs that I had melody lines and, and melody ideas and phrasing ideas, but I didn't have the lyrics. And, and um, you know, lyrics are the hardest thing for me to write. And... We have Rich Jones in, in Michael jo uh, Michael Monroe band, who's in my book of freaking lyrical genius and melodical genius, and and uh, he's he's literally one of my best friends, and I've been playing. He's been playing next to me now for years and years, and and uh, I just thought like maybe he can help me out. Well, Rich is a rock and roll and punk rock writer, you know, and and uh, I started sending him, you know, stuff that were kind of like Balkan stuff maybe or, or like really heavy reggae, you know, and, and he was like, oh man, that's out of my comfort zone. I don't think I can do anything. And and then two days later, he sends me the lyrics and he's like, man, it's just too much fun. You know, it's, it's like, I love doing this. You know, what else you got? And it turned into this really, this kind of thing. Suddenly all the songs were together. And, and uh, then I was thinking like, well, who the hell is going to put this out? And uh, how am I going to get the money to to finish this? And, and I ran into this uh, Finnish record label, independent record label owner who used to, uh, you know, work with major labels. And, and he's done really, really good stuff. And everything he puts out is great. And it comes from the heart. And the the all the artists that he has are very, very amazing and i respect them all so i happened to run into him by chance and it turns out that we had known we'd met each other in, when we were like 16 17 years old he used to play in the band it was just kind of like a birthday party meets david bowie meets iggy kind of thing and uh i sent him four or five songs and he was just like okay let's make a record together and and um i literally put it together now in two thousand covid year of 2020 right i had free time and uh, he gave me the means to do it and he gave me the studio and the engineer to go and finish it off and some of the stuff had already been recorded in different studios you know including my home and and uh, a friend of mine's place in Spain and we did a lot of the drums over there and, and it kind of came together organically and then I need to get because I played pretty much everything first myself you know all the guitars and, and I I realized that I need proper guitar players. <laughs> what I mean, I can play certain things, but I needed to somebody to take him like, wow, there. And uh, I consciously didn't really want to have, you know, Steve Conti or Rich play on it or Andy McCoy or Nasty Suicide or any of those guys that I've been playing with because then the, uh, the sound and the, those are very... Those are all amazing players, but they are very strong individually, and, and uh, it's kind of expected. And I wasn't even sure if they were going to fit to what I do. So I, uh, I call a friend of mine, Christian Martucci, that I met through Chelsea Smiles. You know, he played with Todd Youth and uh, and 
and with Carl Rockfist, who was now Michael Monroe's band, they opened up some shows in, uh, I think, 2008, 2009 for the New York Dolls in California. Wow. And that's how New Christian. And Martucci also, plays in Stone Sour. Yeah, he's huh? in Stone Sour. And he, he's in Stone Sour, yeah. but he was also, he was also Didi Ramon's final guitar player. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and that that guy is a monster player, man. He's a he's a very good dude, and and he's a fucking amazing guitar player. So I thought that maybe he can help me out, and I send him like five songs, and and uh, then he sent him back, and all I can do is hallelujah, thank you, Christian, you know. And then I had still, you know, I I started putting together here in Finland, and uh, and and those songs that Christian played on, they are the like the real hard rock fucking things, you know, punk songs, you know, they are really the in your face kind of things. And uh, and then Ronnie from Smack had moved back to Finland a while back and, and Timo Kalti who played with uh, with the uh, Cherry Bombs and he was the Hanoi Rocks guitar tech for years and years and he's, he's like my brother. He had just moved back to Finland from from, Hels uh, from London. Now hold on, so Simon, thought, we gotta, you know, before you go on about him, he's got a really crazy story too. So he was Hanoi Rocks' tech back in the days. He then gets, yeah. when you're out of the band and they're almost done, they, they name him the bass player in the press, but he never plays a show. Uh, no. You know, so yeah, he, you, you get what I'm saying. And he, yeah. he met uh, Guns N' Roses with you guys while Hanoi was pl you know, playing. And he yeah. kind of befriended Izzy Stradlin. And he is the co-writer of one of the songs in Use Your Illusions, a song called uh, Right Next Door to Hell. It's credit to Izzy and Axel. So it's funny yeah. how these guys all come in a circle. And so he's involved all these years later on your solo record. Yeah, well, Timo is like my brother, man. You know, it's like when I moved to L.A. in 1987, somebody told me that there's another Finn living here because I hadn't seen Timo in two years. I had no idea what happened to him. You know, it was just kind of like, poof, disappeared into thin air. And there was no cell phones, there was no computers, you know. And, and uh, when I moved to LA, it's, it's somebody said that there's this guy called Timo from Finland. I was like, you fucking kidding me. And, and uh, it was a very happy reconnection with him. And we stayed in touch ever since then. He moved back to London, I think early 90s. But, you know, we, we stayed in contact. And, and uh, he, he literally is like my brother. So getting him to play a couple of tracks on the record was, was great. And all the drums on the record is done by uh, <laughs> this guy that I literally did my first musical experiments with. We were like 13, 14 years old and and, uh, and we, we made our fucking space echo together and by, you know, taping two tape heads together and uh, so it gives bomb, space echo stuff. And I remember the song that we did the first Thing that I ever recorded was uh, was with him, and it was the the theme for the close encounters of the third kind. <laughs> do de do do do, and it's pure acid. I hope he said that he has it, but it's somewhere in a you know in a cellar. So I was like, please dig it out. And uh, he used to play in a band called Like on the Cosmonauts. Have you ever heard of these guys? I don't like know a surf, an in instrumental surf punk band, and I think they open up for the Ministry. Al Jurgensen heard him and, and he took him on the road in US and, and uh, he came by in New York every now and then in like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s and, and I would run into him and I would go and get hammered and, you know, hey man, how you been? Because nothing ever changes. If you're really good friends, you know that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the vibe stays there, you know. And when I started making this record, it was like, I got to get Yanni to play on this. And he ended up playing all the drums on every single track. And he's in my live band now. You have some of solo dates. You're going to play some live shows. I'm asking you uh, what, where, where they're at. These dates are now, they are only in Finland for now because of the COVID stuff. So next year I'm trying to, you know, hopefully the situation is better. I can, I can take this on the road because it's coming out everywhere. It's coming out in Europe, in America. It's coming out in Japan, and you know, it's it's. Uh, I really want to start hitting it all the places. Yeah, and the record we should point out is available on vinyl as well. And you know, Sammy, you've got a really good sounding record. Sometimes people think, oh, you made a record during COVID. This is going to be a very digital, you know, phoned in record. No, this sounds like a band that's been playing together for a long time, and and. I think hearing it on vinyl will be a, a, a good experience for people who like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, the sound of the record is it's kind of funny because it's it's easy to overproduce records you know these days you know with pro tools and everything is so tight and everything is not together blah, 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 blah. that's fine you know i have nothing against that and it's it's a good tool and all that but i consciously wanted to keep this kind of loose because i think rock and roll record rock and roll music the proper rock and roll music is loose it's got a swing and it has to live it's not meant to be perfect you know what i mean rolling stones were never perfect you know they were most of their records sound like they're falling apart any minute <laughs> sex Pistols, the clash the same thing you know it's it's uh, all the all my favorite bands that i always adored you know they live you know the music the the instant the, the players you know you can you can feel that they're in a room and they're playing now you know it's not like you know they are squashed together later on by a machine you know so that's what i was looking for with this record you know it's it's uh maybe not the the way that most of the records nowadays are done or the sound of the music nowadays but that's what i wanted to do and i just you know go with my own head as usual so and if you're a fan of this genre of music you want it to sound raw you know you want that pure sound and i think people, i think people are gonna like that so we got to mention september 3rd depending on when you're watching this it could be available right now all you got to do is go to the description it's the first link you can pre-order it or you can buy it. We got to support live music. We got to make sure that, you know, people can make more records. It's a different industry now. It's a different time. So we want to make sure everyone goes and checks it out. The innermost journey to your outermost mind. And Sammy, before I let you go, I got to let people know that there's also another uh, treat. Uh, uh, it, this book is available in Finland now. There's also an audio book. In English, I believe this means the road bends. Is that right? Yes, the road ends. It's coming out through Rare Bird Books, uh, LA book company, or San Francisco, and uh, it's uh, they got in touch with me maybe a year and a half ago, and and we started talking about putting this together in English, and and uh, I'm just really grateful that they're doing this. So we 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 made a really a lot of work to get it translated properly. You know what I mean? That that uh, my weird way of speaking English, it, it gets translated in there, and uh, it's a it's a trippy as book, man. You know, there's everything from moves to rock and roll. <laughs> and we just scratched the surface. I mean, if if you heard the stories that Sammy told, you know, there's so much more. But I can't keep him here all day. You got to get this book to get more into the characters, because you know, I, I, Sammy, I remember first time I met you. We were at the dive bar here in Vegas, and uh, I, I'm just just having a casual conversation. A casual conversation with Sammy is like uh, insane, you know, like the, the people that you've come across and the experiences you've had and the influence that you've had. And so I think this book's a great thing. There's a link for this below as well, because uh, you can pre-order an American version, uh, English version, uh, through Barnes and Nobles and other places. So we'll have that too, and I think that yeah. Uh, it's a great companion to the music. This is a good time to get the two items. Absolutely, man. The stars aligned. Weird universe yeah. is alive. Yep. Yeah. Well, Sammy, I thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jason. It was a lot of thank fun. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I can't wait for other people to hear the record, too. I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I get to play it now. Soon, uh, the rest of the world will hear it as well. Right on, brother. Yeah, get your money on CD, man. You know, support the musicians, man. You don't get shit from the streaming, but go ahead there and get the likes and stream the stuff. But buy the CD and the, the vinyl. It helps us a lot. Yeah, and, sp and spread the word so other people know about it. Yeah, please do. All right, Sammy, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason, man. I'll see you soon.